Welcome to Forum 360, to our global outlook with a local view. I'm Leslie Unger, your host today. We all think we have faced adversity. We would like to think we've overcome adversity in our lives. Then we meet someone or read about someone who really has overcome adversity. If you're like me, we look in awe at them and wonder if we would have had the fortitude and perseverance to rise to the occasion as they have. Our guest today is just that kind of person. As soon as I read about Cindy Job and her dogs, Willow and Zoe, I had to meet her. Actually, them. <laughs> In fact, I had to meet all three of them. A wise person once told me, look for ordinary people doing extraordinary things. At first glance, Cindy may look ordinary. Look again. She, and especially Zoe, are extraordinary. Stay with us and hear and see why. Welcome to Cindy, Zoe, and Willow to Forum 360. Thank I you. welcome <laughs> all of you and I'm thrilled that all of you are here. Thank you, we're glad to be here. Now just so that you know, the one licking from the Kong is Zoe and the one by my feet is Willow. And the one in the chair is Cindy. <laughs> 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 you know, um, in, in wanting you to do this show, um, I thought that we all could use something inspirational. And then it was further cemented for me. The other day, I read in the New York Times a quote, we don't have many ways left in our culture to be collectively inspired. And I think you inspire all of us. Oh, thank you. So I thank, thank you, you so much for being here today. Thank you. Let's start chronologically. Okay. You were 14, mm -hmm. an age that is hard enough without physical challenges. Right. Can you take us back to that time and when you were first diagnosed with cancer? At the very beginning of my freshman year of high school, I was, I had my heart set on becoming a high school cheerleader. Don't we all? And that summer prior to my freshman year, I had been practicing, you know, jumps, cheers, cartwheels, splits, all the, all the above. And it was during a practice for tryouts. Tryouts hadn't started yet, but during a practice, I noticed a bump on my thigh right around this area, of course on my left leg, that just looked like a, a tight mass of muscle or something. Didn't particularly hurt, but I remember showing it to some of my friends in one of my early classes during the day. And then later in the day, some of those same friends said, Cindy, show so-and-so your leg. So I kind of you know, crossed my legs like this and it just really bulged out. And my teacher saw that. And he came over and said, you really should get that checked out. It could be a tumor. So of course, and some other people had said, oh, it's probably a Charlie horse or, you know, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a Charlie horse. So I went home and told my mom and she immediately scheduled an appointment with my doctor. And I remember going to the doctor after school on a Friday. And as soon as he took a look at my leg, he, how long have you had that? He asked. And you know, I didn't really know. I wasn't really concerned. He sent us across the street to the hospital for x-rays. And the same thing with the x-ray technicians. How long have you had that? And the interesting thing was, for some reason, and I don't recall the reason, but I was grounded from going to the football game that night. And after we had gone back to the doctor and he left me in the waiting room and took my mom back into the examining room, on the way home, everything had shifted, and I was now allowed to go to the game and allowed to have friends over. I should have wondered about that, but I didn't. Sure. I was just excited, and I'm, I'm going to the game. Mm -hmm. As soon as we got home, she said to my dad, I need to show you something in the basement. So the next day, I was admitted to what was called Timken Mercy. Now it's Mercy Hospital. And uh, she brought me my suitcase, and I said, why do I have a suitcase if it's just for tests? And she said, you'll probably have to stay overnight. And it was a whirlwind of tests, and um, I was admitted on Saturday. By Wednesday, I had exploratory surgery, and they found that they had, it was a very aggressive cancer. It was osteosarcoma. And they gave my parents the option, I didn't know it at the time, but they didn't know if even with the amputation, if I would live longer than about six months. Mm. So they gave my parents the option of letting me keep my leg and trying to fight it with chemotherapy and radiation or 
take my leg and try to get it all. So they opted to take my leg. So I didn't know any of that for years. And it was always a puzzle to me why they're drawing blood so often, how does that relate to a tumor on my leg? But they were afraid it would go to my bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And it, I was lucky it never did. So I had the amputation one week following that doctor's appointment, Friday to Friday. They did the amputation and that was it. Now, you say that, that was it, but can you remember what is a conversation like to tell a 14-year-old? Well, I do remember my parents were devastated, mm -hmm. and the doctor who, I really, he had an accent and I had a really difficult time understanding him. I was a little shy, and he told me that there was a chance they would have to take my, they would have to amputate my leg, and I remember saying, that's when you cut it off, isn't it? And he said yes, and I heard the word chance, and so, you know, sometimes there's a chance of rain mm -hmm. and it doesn't rain, so I just hung on to that word chance, and I, my eyes filled with tears when he told me, and he said, this is very hard on your parents. You need to be strong for your parents, so I sucked it back up, and, and I was, and I, I don't really remember why I was so strong about it. I just remember going through the motions. I was so um, overwhelmed with support, people coming to visit me. My name was on the radio and people had to, you know, the mail delivery had to come in, you know, a separate trip just with things for me. Wow. And I would wake up and open, you know, and my, my dad was a high school principal and my mom was a teacher. Both of their staffs did things for me. It was just so, I had so much support. Well, would you, would you identify that as a reason? You know, you have said that you kicked cancer to the curb, but you're still 14 years old. Um, I don't care if you're 24, 34, or 44. You know, I kind of see it that with adversity, especially something like that, that there's kind of like three buckets. There's the bitter bucket, where people become bitter, like, why me? There's the kind of grudging bucket, right. where people grudgingly accept it and try to go on with their life in some way. And then there's the inspirational bucket, that people not only go on, but they lead inspiring lives and inspire others. Mm -hmm. how, how would you say that, how did you end up in that third inspirational bucket? Well, I can't really remember it being a decision I made. I just remember thinking, as I laid in that hospital bed, how am I going to do this? How am I going to walk with one leg? And I remember thinking, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't really um, religious or spiritual at the time, but I remember thinking, God will help me. And I don't, you know, it was never a decision to not feel sorry for myself or to try to be in a good mood. I just was. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, I could not wait to get back to school. I never had that feeling of being embarrassed mm -hmm. about it. I felt, you know, I, I just really didn't even think of that. I couldn't wait to get back to school and it wasn't like I was afraid of how I looked. I think when I've got my first prosthetic leg, I felt more abnormal wearing the leg than I did on crutches because on crutches, even to this day, I'm more agile and I'm faster and I can do things that I can't do with my leg on. But I will say I will never give up my leg because there are so many things I can do wearing my leg because it gives me my hands back. So I never really made that decision that I'm going to look at the bright side, but I always just have. You know what you said about the leg and the crutches, um, few people may know that Miss Wheelchair America contest actually takes place in Akron every oh, summer. No, I, I know. Didn't like know nobody knows this. <laughs> right. And for a couple years I was one of the judges and one of the contestants had one of those wheelchairs that the seat raised up. Uh huh. And I remember her saying, you know, you've no idea how how important that is because when you're in a wheelchair you're always looking up at people. Mm -hmm. So you you were talking about the difference between crutches and, and, and your leg. Um, what are some things that we don't think about? Well, with my crutches, I can just pick them up and go, and I can walk on ground that is uneven because I can, you know, make the difference with my hands. If I'm walking on bumpy grass or gravel or even sidewalk that's, you know, if it's going down this way, I can walk if my prosthetic is on that side. But because I'm missing not only my foot and my knee, but also my hip, all three work together, and I have to throw my leg forward with my waist. So 
When I'm walking on ground where my prosthetic is lower, I can still clear the ground. But when I'm walking even on the side of the street that just kind of curves down a little bit, if I'm walking on the side where my prosthetic is higher, I can't raise up high enough to clear the ground because I'm having to do that with my, I don't have any femur or anything to make my leg, you know, I've just, I'm throwing it forward <laughs> with my waist. So it's very difficult for me to walk, you know, on the beach, for instance, way more doable on crutches. Even though they sink in a little bit, I can still do it with my prosthetic. I can't raise up high enough to, and sometimes, Anybody in my situation, they call it vaulting. You kind of vault on this foot to clear the ground to make this one not, you know, hit the ground as you're moving forward. Before we get to Zoe and Willow, I want to ask you, we have a painting in our house that a, a Mexican painter um, painted that we happened to meet. And in the middle of it, it's a circus, and in the middle of it is a one-armed juggler. And he said that the one-armed juggler is supposed to represent that everybody has a handicap, some people are just more noticeable than others. I've always thought that. I've thought everybody has something that they're dealing with, some kind of a hardship or handicap. Mm -hmm. Mine is just so obvious. And you know, and that's the first thing. I've told the story so many times about what happened simply because it's the first thing you want to know about me when you see me, what happened to your leg that it almost feels like I'm telling a story or, you know, out of a book. It happened to someone but, else. Yeah, it happened to somebody else, not me, but that person that I'm recalling about was me. And sometimes it's hard for me to believe it. I remember in college one time when I was walking up to this new music building and it was all glass front and I walk, I'm walking up on my crutches, missing a leg, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's how people see me. Because I never saw myself as disabled or, you know, different. I just never acted like I was different. And I feel like because I'm comfortable with it, it makes the people around me comfortable. Well, you know, it, it, in my real job, I'm a communication coach, and I always tell people, especially when you're giving a speech, if you're comfortable, your audience is comfortable. Right. Um, were you always comfortable? I think I was, except in high school when I did have, I got a prosthetic leg probably about six months after I lost my leg. I didn't like it at all because it was not anything like what I have today. It wouldn't, if it bent a little bit, it was sort of like a tree branch. You can't bend it a little. It either bent all the way and I'm falling down if I only wanted it to bend a little or it was not bending at all, it's just, you know, straight. So this leg will allow me to go down a ramp and bend a little bit, it reads my movements, it doesn't move for me, but um, I remember being very self-conscious about getting up out of my chair. I remember in speech class, for instance, having to go mm -hmm. up to give my speech. Giving the speech was not the hard part for me, it was getting out of my chair and having everybody watch every step I took. And I always had my hand right here on my thigh as I was walking as a sense of security. It didn't really help. <laughs> if I fell, I fell. But I w just felt like if my knee bent and I wasn't ready, I would have my hand there. And I used a cane. My goal, my New Year's resolution in 1975 was to quit using that cane. And it really didn't do anything for me except gave me that security. Scary, sure. Something to grab onto. But I kept that resolution sure. and I never used a cane again. So, um, you know, that was when I felt really self-conscious, when I had to get up in front of everybody. Where, Which with you the do leg. all the time now. Right. <laughs> so. And with the crutches, I never felt that way. I knew I looked more normal. Well, I was going to say, do you think that you were expected to be appreciative of getting the prosthetic leg? Like, was that expected to be a good well, thing for you? Well, my doctor told my parents shortly after I got it, to make me, you know, it, it goes around my waist to attach because I don't have any limb to really attach to. So, you know, it's not comfortable and it's, you know, it takes a while to put on, take off, and I mean, not very long, but still, grabbing my crutches is quicker and easier and I felt more, you know, mobile. Well, my doctor said, make her wear it. She needs to realize this is a part of her now. So I wore it to school and I had a job in a grocery store after school and I wore it to that job. But when I was at home or with my friends or with my boyfriend, I used crutches. So let me ask you, if you were counseling young people, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere around your age, mm -hmm. would you tell, what would you tell them about that? I would say effect? you have to do what's comfortable for you. Because some people, you know, I never wanted any part of a wheelchair and I, I just didn't want that. 
Some people are comfortable with that. Uh, some people hate crutches. People have said to me through the years, and crutches will always be a part of my life. Once I take my leg off before bed, if I'm you know, moving around the house, I'm using crutches. And they're just second nature to me. They're not, you know, they're just a part of me. They, they became a part of me so long ago, I don't remember not having them. But I'm comfortable with that. Some people aren't. Mm -hmm. um, I've, you know, hopped around my house some, but I now, with my prosthetic, when I tried it again, I wasn't sure I was going to like it, and I made my kids not tell anybody because I didn't want people kind of pestering me, like, well, what, what about your leg? And But I end up, you know, there are some things that you really can't do on crutches, like shoveling snow, for instance, because if you, you know, you are can, raising but your... But you can do it. Yeah, well, well, I can do it. But, you know, if you have your crutches under your arm, you mm -hmm. can't really right. lift the snow to throw it sure. without your crutches falling. And if you're balancing, it's slippery. So, and then when you throw it, it throws you off balance. So, I love my leg for shoveling snow, for standing <laughs> at the sink. I would not have expected <laughs> to think of you shoveling snow. Well, you know... Some things I do, people are think I'm crazy to do it, but I don't know. It's what makes me me. I just want to, you know, I, I mow my own grass. I don't have a push mower. I have a, a little tractor, John Deere tractor, and I don't mind doing it. I'm out there, it's, you know, it's when I do my best thinking, and it's kind of fun. So let me, um, I do want to ask you about your kids, but I've got to get to Willow and Zoe first. Okay. <laughs> because we are thrilled to have um, two-legged guests, but we're really thrilled to have four-legged guests. But so this is Willow and this, this is, is Zoe. Willow. Let's start with Willow. How has she helped you? Well, actually, she helped mend my broken heart because mm -hmm. I had a three-legged golden retriever before her named Wrigley. And when Wrigley was not doing so well because... Let me just inter interrupt you for a okay. moment. Our time has come by so quickly. Um, today we are talking to Cindy Job and her dogs, Willow and Zoe, and an amazing story of overcoming mm -hmm. adversity and um, in a delightful way. So you had Wrigley. I had Wrigley. Uh, he was starting to have a hard time moving around. His back leg, uh, his, he was missing his right front. His right hind leg was starting to shake when he would get up and down and he was more using it as a kickstand and he was a bigger golden retriever than these two and he just really started having trouble so I took him to the vet they did x-rays and told me the devastating news that he had osteosarcoma which is the same kind of cancer I had and I cried for about a week thinking you know life isn't fair because it was just a cruel twist of fate in my mind yes well my vet told me you can take him to you know a specialist and get another opinion and I did know one golden retriever that survived on two legs but I think it was mm -hmm. two front or two hind where they had a cart but having two on the same side and being as big as he was my daughter and I researched that but it wasn't good news so I took him to a specialist and he said you know I don't think it's osteosarcoma I think it's osteoarthritis and I was so thrilled to hear that news but in the end it turned out his life just went downhill. He couldn't get around. He was on so many pain meds that I just had to make the decision that it was time for him. Mm -hmm. I was only keeping him here for me. So I was so broken hearted about that. I didn't want another dog, but a couple of weeks into no Wrigley, I decided the only way to get through it is have another puppy to love mm -hmm. and honor Wrigley in that way. So I got Willow. She was 10 weeks old and I wanted to name her with a name that started with W to honor Wrigley. Wrigley because Wrigley started with a W. So I came to Willow and it means healing and grace and I thought perfect. Now for, for many people that are totally, you know, able-bodied people, two dogs may seem like too many. I have two dogs, but I know that for a lot of people, two dogs may seem like a lot for any single person living by themselves. So how did Zoe then come well, into your life? I was, you know, working on training Willow, and she actually um, is trained. She was, you know, able to be a, a service dog mm -hmm. for me, and she'll do things like pick up things when I drop them and bring them to me, or she'll go get the newspaper, and she does have a little harness that has a handle. So as life goes on if I become a little more unstable as I'm walking she could you know give me some balance or like when I'm going down steps without a handrail I can mm -hmm. hang on to her now I will say since COVID began I haven't been taking her anywhere as you know training with that but then I was showing a friend about a year ago where I had found Willow online and up popped a little ad for this three-legged golden retriever who 
just stole my heart immediately. But I'm thinking, you know, I actually, I messaged the lady and somebody else was already interested in her, but I thought, please let me know if that mm -hmm. falls through. Mm -hmm. And I just kept thinking about her, kept thinking about her. A few days later, she, uh, the lady messaged me and said um, that nobody else had come to get her. Was I still interested? So I asked if I could come see her, and I promised myself I would not take her home. I had to really think about it and not make a knee-jerk reaction because it wouldn't be fair to Willow, it wouldn't be fair to Zoe, and it wouldn't be fair to me to take on more than I could mm -hmm. do. So I went and visited her, and I said, will you please let me just think about it for a day or two? I promise I'll get back to you. And I wrote a list of pros and cons. Mm -hmm. The cons was a very long list compared to the pros, but the pros were stronger. They were so, better quality pros. Yes, they, yes. they just booted the cons <laughs> out. You know, I kept thinking of all the things. But I, and I couldn't quit thinking about her. And I went to the pet store, and I was buying things for her. And I had not committed yet to getting her. And I messaged the woman right as I was standing in line at the pet store and said, I think I'd like to move forward with coming to get Zoe. So I went the next day, brought her home. Now, what do, when people meet you or you speak to people, what do they say about the two of you? They just what think it's message, amazing that, that I was meant to have her and she was meant to have me and that, you know, we just, because I really feel like I understand what she goes through. I understand when she's tired and she, you know, has trouble doing things like getting in or out of the car, it's, you know, just little things that I know she's going to be able to do without any trouble mm -hmm. and she has a little trouble. Now, you've said that. Uh, when you speak to people, you know, individually or in a group that maybe they're a recent amputee, that mm -hmm. a dog can, can connect with them in ways that a human can't. Can you tell us about that? Well, I really feel like, you know, you can tell someone you can do this and you can give them the inspiration of things that you have achieved. Like people are amazed that I became a mother and I became a teacher and I taught, you know, for a, a long career. Mm -hmm. um, there are inspired by that a little bit, but you know, hearing you say you can do this and it will get easier, you know, that's just words. Exactly. And wow. sometimes people are in a place where they don't even really want to hear that. Mm -hmm. But a dog can give the message just being there, not filling you up with all these words, just showing you that, um, you know, giving you a little attention and just being this calm influence and showing you that, you know, they're happy. Now, let me ask you, because we just we, because we just have a couple minutes um, remaining. So you end up on a television show called The Wizard of Paws. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. here you are, the school teacher, you know, from Stark County, and now you end up on a television show. So can you briefly tell us a couple highlights about that? Well, it was a, it was a wonderful experience that I'll never forget. It was, I was inquiring about a prosthetic for Zoe, and the woman was explaining to me how the process works, and she said, you'll need to take this to your vet to help make the mold. And when I told her, I said, I'll probably take it to my prosthetist because I'm also an amputee. And she said, oh, you're an amputee. And so she told me about the show, and she asked if I minded if she shared mm -hmm. my story with the producers and it just went from there and they came to my home I, at first I thought you know I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about it can I think about it and then I thought oh I'd be crazy not to do it because they come to my home and it would be the best fit of all for Zoe because the wizard himself would be making her cast mm -hmm. and it was just such a wonderful experience that, um, he made the he made the leg and then we did have a little trouble with it it was kind of hitting this little elbow bone on her and causing mm -hmm. a sore so two weeks ago, I took her to Virginia, and he made some changes to it, and voila, no sore. <laughs> so, and you can tell the yeah, difference. Yeah, oh, I, absolutely. Before, she, I'd put it on her, and her whole personality would change. She would lay down, and she wouldn't want to get treats. She wouldn't want to play. Now I put it on, and she's still zooming around the house and around the yard, and happy as can be. Now, recently, um, my last question for you would be that American Humane Society conducted one of the first studies on therapy dogs, mm -hmm. and they found that regular visits from therapy dogs, that patients remain stable instead of, of going downhill, and that parents reported that children had significant improvements in school, but from what you've seen, can you briefly comment on, on, on what a therapy dog can do for well, someone? Well, I know firsthand that, you know, Willow has never been a therapy dog, and Zoe not yet, hopefully she will, but I know from the time she was a puppy, I was taking her to visit my mom in the nursing home, mm -hmm. and it was the highlight 
of not only my mom's day, but everybody. Everyone that got sometimes to. my mom's room was down at the end of the hall, and sometimes I felt guilty because it took me so long to get to her because everyone just wanted to love on her. And it just I don't know, people just love animals. And to see an animal when, you know, outside, if you're in the hospital or if you're in a nursing home and you don't have access to the love mm -hmm. of a pet, mm -hmm. when you see one, especially one that loves to be loved on, it just changes your whole mood. Can we, in, in about 10 or 15 seconds, can we give a shout out to your two children who sound outstanding? Yes, my son Zach and my daughter Riley. They're my son is 32, my daughter's 27, and they, they have been my best cheerleaders their whole lives. So, you know, when I got my leg, and um, just, they're just so wonderful adults. I wanted them to have a shout out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our goal at Forum 360 is to bring you a global outlook with a local view. Overcoming adversity, especially during this pandemic, is pretty global. Cindy Job shared her story as a young girl with a prosthetic leg. Cindy also shared Zoe's story as a puppy with a prosthetic leg and the heroes along the way, like the Wizard of Paws. Remember to look for ordinary people and seemingly ordinary dogs doing extraordinary things. Cindy, Willow, and Zoe do the extraordinary every day. What can you learn from them? I'm Leslie Unger. Thank you for joining us today on Forum 360, our global outlook with a local view. Forum 360 is brought to you by John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, Hudson Community Television, the Rubber City Radio Group, Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron, Blue Green, Electric Impulse Communications, and Forum 360 supporters.